Hello my viewers, do you ever wonder how PC has been downsized quite a lot for the past few years? Today you no longer need a full size tower to fit all those powerful components. Would you like to know how? In this video, I would like to show you a build log of one of my own. Here is the package that I received from azerty.nl, an online retailer in the Netherlands. I will now unbox the package. Surely this is exciting, so thumbs up to Azerty for the nice and secure packaging. After opening the box, I will now introduce the parts that I ordered. This is going to be an AMD build, and here I have a Ryzen 2600 6-core 12-thread mid-range processor. The motherboard is a MSI B450i Gaming Plus AC. This is a mini ITX motherboard with a recent B450 chipset. The memory consists of a 32GB kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX rated at 3000MHz, a 250GB Samsung E4 X60 SSD will be the boot drive. Power will be supplied by the 450W Corsair SF450 Gold rated SFX power supply unit. The case is a Silverstone SG13. But it does not come with a fan, so here is a Noctua A12 120mm fan with pulse width modulation capability. Additionally, a SFX adapter is also required for the power supply unit to fit in the case. Aside from brand new parts, I also purchased used parts such as the graphics card which is a HIS Radeon R7 360 with 2GB VRAM. Another used part is the Seagate 2TB hard drive which I will be using as massive storage. The complete part list can be found in the PC part picker link in the description. And they are all guaranteed to be compatible. Then without further ado, let's get to building. I will now unbox the case which is secured with polystyrene enclosure inside the box. You will find a ziplock bag containing the manual which I strongly recommend to read for every new build. The case is fully made of metal with its sides full of circular holes except underneath. Here you can find 4 rubber feet and 4 screw holes for 2.5 inch draft insulation. At the back, you can find the fitting for the IO shield, an ATX size PSU and 2 slot graphics card. Then let's move on to the MSI B450i Gaming Plus AC. Opening the box will reveal the motherboard inside the entire static bag, but let's put it aside for now. Here we can also find the IO shield with the MSI Dragon logo on it, some screws for M.2 drive, two SATA cables, one angle and one straight, a MSI Dragon sticker, Drive or disk, but who use an optical drive these days anyway? MSI Gaming Land booklet, a thank you card, Wi Fi antenna, the very important manual, and a quick installation guide. Now we are back to the Ryzen 2600 processor. I didn't go with the X variant as lower TDP rating is often preferred for limiting thermal situations in a small form factor build. Inside the packaging, there is a smaller box containing the processor and a Ryzen sticker, and next to it is the Rave Stealth Cooler. Moving on to the DRAM department, this is the Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 at 3000MHz, and I ordered a 32GB kit as I need it for a certain productivity task. For gaming though, 16GB is usually more than sufficient. This is the Corsair SF450. A modular 450 watt god rated SFX power supply unit. Inside, you will find some documentations, the 3 pin power cable, a pouch containing the modular cables, some zip ties for cable management, and a power supply itself, which is rather tiny and light. The unit is all black with a power switch at the back, a few ports for the modular power cables and a 92mm fan underneath. Now we can test these components to see if we can boot into the BIOS and move them into the case later. This is a process called breadboarding and if any of them were dead, 
we would know immediately. First, I will remove the static on my hands by touching the power supply unit which is already connected to a power outlet. As an alternative though, you can wear an ESD wristband which I don't have. Next, unpack the motherboard from the anti-static bag and put it on top of its box. Then unpack the processor carefully. AMD processors, unlike Intel's, have thousands of pins underneath which you don't want to bend. To lift the processor, always hold it from the sides. To install the processor onto the motherboard, first lift the retention bar. Don't use too much force on it or you can snap it easily. The processor needs to be aligned with the socket or the holes on the motherboard. This is done by matching the golden corner triangle on the processor with the same indicator on the motherboard. Please always check with your motherboard manual on this indicator. Afterward, simply drop the processor into the socket and it should require no extra force. Then push the retention bar all the way back to its original position. If the processor did not fit, your alignment may be wrong, so don't force it in or you may break something. Next, prepare the RAM sticks. Just don't touch the golden contacts at the bottom. Locate the dim slots on your motherboard. In most ITX boards, there are only two slots. To install the RAM, push the edge latches aside. While usually there are two latches on each slot, you may find only one side is movable depending on your motherboard. On your RAM sticks, notice the notch next to the golden contacts. Match this notch with the one on the slot. Then push the RAM sticks into the slot. On new boards, Usually this requires quite a bit of force. However, if it still does not fit, the notch alignment may be wrong, so do check afterwards. If you are only using one stick however, check with your motherboard manual on which RAM slot to use first. Let's get the CPU cooler next. Stock coolers usually come with thermal paste underneath, so you don't have to apply it yourself. If there were a piece of plastic covering the thermal paste though, remove it now. Depending on the cooler type, you may need to remove the cooler fixture next to the socket. Then align the CPU cooler with the holes on the motherboard. Make sure that the alignment allows the cooler power cable to reach the CPU fan power pins. Check your motherboard manual on the location of this pin. Once the cooler is aligned, tighten the screws in diagonal order as I'm pointing with my screwdriver on the screen. Do 3 to 4 turns for each screw and move on to the next one across. Now plug the fan power cable to the CPU fan header. Some motherboards may have multiple fan headers, so make sure you plug to the correct one. We will now move to the power supply unit. I already have the 24 pin ATX power plugged into the Corsair SF450. I will also do the same thing for the 8 pin CPU power cable. Hold the 24 pin cable and locate the plug on the motherboard. And do the same for the 8 pin CPU power. Both power cables have clip on them. This will help you identify the correct orientation of the cable. If it does not fit, the cable orientation may be incorrect. Afterward, we will install the graphics card. Find the PCI Express slot on your motherboard. Notice that the slot has both the side latch as well as a notch on it, just like the RAM slot. Push the side latch aside and put the graphics card into the slot. The latch will give a click when the graphics card is secured. Some graphics card requires additional power, so don't forget to plug in the 6 or 8 pin power cable into the graphics card and the power supply unit. Now that all parts are powered, plug your screen to the graphics card and flip the switch on the power supply unit. To turn on the PC, you can plug the power button to the header on the motherboard like what I do here. Or you can touch both ends of the power button header on the motherboard with a flat head screwdriver. If the BIOS screen shows up on your screen, then all components are working fine. Congratulations! Let's step back a bit to the SG13. The case is basically a metal frame covered with a thin steel enclosure. A small plastic bag containing all the screws is attached to one side of the case.
The front panel can also be detached from the frame, revealing the front I.O. panel and a dust filter. The case also has motherboard standoff built-in, and the case fan is to be installed on the provided compartment. Now I will unbox the Noctua 8 valve fan. This particular fan is optimized to deliver higher static pressure and airflow in most cases when compared to other Noctua fans. Inside the box, you will find the fan itself and a few accessories, including extension cables, a low noise adapter, a gasket, and four rubber push pins. Then here you can see that I have installed the fan into the case. It's time to put the motherboard into the case. I left the power supply cables on the motherboard as it might be more difficult to install them later. I did a beginner mistake though, as I forgot to install the I.O. shield first. But fortunately, it was not too late. Aligning the motherboard onto the standoffs is also easier once the I.O. shield is installed. Afterward, secure the motherboard into the case by installing the suitable screws. Next, you can inspect whether the motherboard is tight in the case or not. You can also now start installing the front I.O. cables to the headers on the motherboard. For the location of the headers, you should refer to your motherboard manual. Here, for example, you can see I am installing the header for the front panel USB 3 ports. We move on to the storage. I will now unbox the Samsung EVO X60 250GB SSD. In modern builds, it is always recommended to have solid state drive as your boot drive as it would significantly improve the operating system responsiveness and load times. For massive storage though, the hard disk will do the job, and here I have the 2TB Seagate screwed onto the drive bay. The hard disk bay will be hanging on the case ceiling supported by the case frame, so make sure that all four screws are installed correctly. Afterward, install both the SATA cable and the power cable to the hard disk. The other end of the SATA cable is to be plugged to the SATA port on the motherboard. Check your motherboard manual for its exact location. The power cable will originate from the power supply unit, and usually there are several plugs available. Simply use the one that is the easiest to install without straining the cable. For the SSD installation, I had to improvise since the SATA power cable from Corsair is angled. Fortunately, since I'm using a rather short graphics card, I can slip the SSD next to the frame and leave it there. After all of the power cables are plugged in and secured, install the power supply unit into the SFX adapter and screw both of them to the back of the case. Then, it's time to see if everything turns out okay. Plug the power cable to the back of the power supply unit and the HDMI cable to the graphics card. Afterward, flip the switch and turn on the PC and if all goes well, the screen should now indicate that there is no bootable drive as we have not installed operating system on the SSD. This is usually one of the most anticipated moments for PC builder as sometimes your PC just refuses to boot properly. So thumbs up to ourselves for this build. Now the build is almost complete. Simply put the case cover back together and secure it with the provided screws. We can now take some time to lay back and enjoy this new build. What about peripherals though? Well, in my remaining budget, I was able to afford this Logitech G Pro mouse to give a bit of RGB flavor to the build. But for the keyboard, it'll be simply a generic Dell Office keyboard, no mechanical for this time. Well, this pretty much summarizes the build log of this mini ITX PC. The only remaining thing to do is to install the operating system. 
but there are already many tutorials out there, so do check them out. I did measure the weight of the PC though. At 4.9 kilograms, it is just slightly heavier than most 17 inch gaming laptops, and you can still save almost a whole kilogram if you decided to use 2.5 inch drives only. This PC will be relatively easy to move around for LAN parties, although you still need to figure out how to bring a monitor with it. Small form factor builds can easily suffer to thermal throttling due to poor heat dissipation planning. Hence, to demonstrate that this build remains stable while performing demanding tasks, I monitored the component's temperature with hardware monitor version 1.35. When running Adobe software such as Photoshop or Illustrator, you can observe that the system temperature averages at 44 degrees Celsius, with the CPU package being warmer at 51 degrees. The GPU is not used intensively, so the temperature hovers around 52 degrees. I have also tested the gaming performance of the system for over an hour in No Man's Sky with the next DLC. The game is known to be quite resource intensive and not very optimized for both Nvidia and AMD graphics card. The game settings have been set to 1080p or medium with no anti-aliasing and post-processing effects. Throughout the gameplay, the FPS averages at 40 with occasional dip to 25 when the scene is full of objects such as when you are on the ground. However, you can easily obtain 45 to 50 FPS once you are in the air. I also left the hardware monitor open to observe the temperature and the clock speed of the Ryzen 2600. On average, it would run at 3.6 to 3.7 GHz on all cores, which is slightly higher than its base clock. On some occasions though, it can overclock itself to 4 GHz even without user intervention. And while the CPU temperature stays around 60 degrees Celsius in game, the Radeon R7 360 runs somewhat warmer with the temperature at borderline 80 degrees. I must emphasize though that the graphics card came from 2015 and has been used previously. I have not attempted to remove the graphics card heatsink to see if the thermal paste has completely dried out or not. Regardless, I did not observe any thermal throttling nor any other serious issues with the graphics card aside from it being overwhelmed by most AAA game titles of 2018. Overall, I would say the PC would run most games at 1080p low to medium settings comfortably. Alright then, I guess it's time to end this video. I do hope that this build log will provide yourself with some idea on how compact high performance PC could be nowadays. If you have any questions, simply put it in the comment section and I will try to reply in the meantime. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up button, or if you find the video not very amusing, go ahead and give the thumbs down. Regardless, your feedback will be helpful for my next videos. I also would like to thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you in my next publications. Cheers!